Hey guys, Chris here with The Good Old Gamer. So today we're finally going to take a look at the Intel Pentium 4 Netburst architecture versus AMD's K8 architecture, which was in the Athlon 64 processors. Want to see how this turns out? Stick around. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Hey guys, if you like videos like this, please consider becoming a patron over on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can seriously help me out in getting tech on hands so we can do more videos like this one right here. I want to thank everybody for their support, and links will be in the description below. Now, on to the video. First off, I want to give a shout out to Extreme 4K Gaming. He's a fan of the channel, and he helped out after our 750i SLI motherboard for LGA 775 took a dump. And he went ahead and sent me a uh, 780i SLI, which is what we use for the tests in this video. I went ahead and used the same Intel Pentium D920 and retested it to make sure that the dying board did not have any effect. It didn't. The numbers that I posted in uh, the IPC test 1.5 are legitimate. Now on to the show. All right, a couple of you guys out there asked for a little bit of backstory with these videos. So we're going to start back with the Netburst architecture and the Intel Pentium 4. Now, there are many revisions of the Pentium 4. Willamette was the first iteration. This is the one that used the RD RAM. And this wasn't very popular and did not do very well. The Northwood Pentium 4 is the one most of us pretty much attribute to the beginning of the Pentium 4 era, as it was the first processor in the lineup that was actually even competitive with the Athlon XPs at the time. We'll go over that a little bit more in a second. Gallantin is basically just the extreme version of that. And then Prescott was really the final revision of the Pentium 4. Now, of course, they did shrink it down to 65 nanometers on Cedar Mill, but it's essentially the same thing. Now, for our testing, because we have to test uh, in 64-bit windows, we need 64-bit capable CPUs. So all tests will be done on Prescott, which will be in the form of the Pentium D830 and Cedar Mill, which is the Pentium D930. And right here, we have confirmation that the Pentium D uh, Smithfield, which is the 830, is just two Prescott cores. And the Pressler core, which is on the 930, is just two Cedar Mill cores. So it's not really like we're comparing something different by using the Pentium Ds. All tests were done single thread. So that doesn't really matter and helps streamline the testing. Now, starting off with Northwood, like I said, it was competing against the Athlon XPs, not even the Athlon 64s that we're going to be looking at today. And this is when Intel shrunk down the Pentium 4 from 180 nanometers down to 130, which is a reasonably large jump there. And as you can see here, the Northwood processors were able to compete with the Athlon XPs at this point. But interestingly enough, if you look, you have the Pentium 4 2 gigahertz against the 2000 plus, And that's the reason why AMD did this naming scheme was only running at 1.67 gigahertz. Ironically enough, according to AMD, if you look at this, the 70 megahertz difference equals about 100 megahertz for Intel which gives them the claim that their IPC at the time was about 30% faster. And that's on the Athlon XP. Now, when essentially the final revision of the Pentium 4 finally arrived in the Prescott core, a non-tech had to say this. If you're looking for nothing more than a purchasing decision, let's put it simply. If you're not an overclocker, do not buy Prescott, where there is an equivalently clocked Northwood available. This means they didn't even like the final revision of the Pentium 4 over the Northwood chips. I really wish that these were x64, so this way I could actually test those out. The CPU is no faster than Northwood, and in most cases is actually slower. So it was actually a step back. Imagine Intel releasing a newer CPU that took a step backwards. When you include AMD in the picture, the recommendation hasn't changed since the Athlon 64 was introduced. And on their review for the Athlon 64 and Athlon 64 FX, it's Judgment Day. That was the title all the way back September 23rd, 2003. In their final words, seemingly overnight, AMD went from about to fall off the performance charts to being competitive with Intel's latest and greatest. But there's much more to the situation than proclaiming a winner and leaving it at that. 
So they go into where AMD kind of stood at that point, price points, things of that nature. That's not too much of a concern here today because you can pick these chips up cheap as hell and we can benchmark them all we want. So that's what we're going to go ahead and cover here today. So let's go ahead and meet the CPUs. So for the AMD side, we're using the AMD Athlon 64 X2 6000 Plus, which comes at stock speeds of 3 gigahertz, which is what everything is tested on. We have the Athlon 64 5000 Plus coming in at 2.6 gigahertz, but I was able to get this overclocked straight to the 3 gigahertz mark but just by using the multiplier because it's a black edition. So nothing else changed, no front side bus increases, no memory tweaks. It was just bumped straight up, straight overclock, and that works just fine. The differences between these two parts is the Athlon 64 6000 Plus has one megabyte of L2 cache per core, and the 5000 Plus has 512 kilobytes of L2 cache per core. So it has half the cache. And then on the Intel side, we have the Pentium D930, which comes in at four megabytes of L2 cache, which is two megabytes per core, as compared to the Pentium D830, which has one megabyte of L2 cache per core for a total of two megabytes. So at each scale, they have double the L2 cache of their AMD competition. Let's see how this plays out. Starting off with Cinebench R15, we can see AMD is way ahead. Um, interestingly enough, we do see that the one megabyte of L2 cache has a significant difference in this particular benchmark as compared to the Athlon 64 with only 512 kilobytes. So we're seeing a pretty large gap here of 13 points. Now on the Intel side, we don't really see any difference at all between the two cores. Now we do know that this is a more refined version of this and architecturally there's no real changes there and ironically enough the extra cache here has no major benefit. Now for percentages we're using the Pentium D830 as the baseline as 100% as this is consistently the slower processor out of the bunch. So overall, we have a 3% bump for that one extra point in Cinebench for the uh, Pentium D930. And then the Athlon 64 with only 512 kilobytes of L2 cache is at 147%. So it's 47% faster than the Pentium D830 or Prescott Core. Now, going up to one megabyte of cache, this jumps all the way up to 182%. So 82% faster in Cinebench R15. This is a massive increase. Imagine if any CPU manufacturer, either of them today, had an 82% lead. That's just ridiculous. We're quibbling over 10%, and right here we have 82. All right, guys, moving on over to Blender. Now, this is measured in seconds, so lower is better here, clearly. Uh, so we're seeing well over 2,000 uh, seconds here. This is about 40-some-odd minutes, and the AMD CPUs come in, at much closer to about 20. So we're seeing a massive difference here. Now I wanted to go ahead and keep the percentage scale the same. So we have the Pentium D at 830. If that's 100%, I, I used a 0.5% here. Typically I just round up or down, but uh, because it was slightly faster, but not much, very, very uh, unnoticeable there. But we're basically seeing twice the performance on Blender as compared to the Pentium series. So K8 has a strong win here. We saw 82% before. And we're seeing about 100% increase at this point. Ironically enough, not as big of a jump between the 512K and one megabyte L2 cache here. So not every program is going to benefit from the larger cache, but it's very clear that these tests to some degree do benefit from it. So there must be something else going on here or these programs do not really need more than the one megabyte of L2. Jumping over to CPU-Z, we see a much tighter race. Now this might be one of the reasons why a lot of people were saying, I don't know how reliable this is, but we're gonna put it into the mix. Like I said, it's a very good benchmark and it produces the same consistent numbers over and over again. So anyway, we still have the Pentium D830 at 97.3, and then we have the Athlon 64 one megabyte chart topping at 114.6. 
Going over to percentages, we do see a little bit of a difference here. The cash seems to matter a little bit more on this benchmark. So we have a 5% increase going to the two megabyte L2 cache on the NetBurst architecture. But going to the K8, even with the 512K, we're going up to 116%. So uh, that's 16% faster. It's not twice as fast. It's just 16% faster, which isn't that huge, but it does show that even baseline, this processor was a good bit faster. This is a much bigger difference than what we're seeing in processors here today. Now, moving on up to the Athlon 64 one megabyte, we just gain an extra 2%. Not a major jump like we saw in the other benchmarks. Now, this one gets really interesting. So this is where we have the integer test and the floating point 32 test. Now, we'll start with the FP32 as they're all the same across the board, meaning in programs that needed floating point precision on the CPU, they're identical. There was no difference between any of these CPUs. Cache didn't, didn't matter. The architectures didn't matter. That's just where they landed. Now, on integer, this is a much different story. We're seeing the Pentium D830 and the 930 basically at 2196, 98. So they're almost identical. Really no difference going with the extra cache there. And then with the Athlon 64s, basically the same thing. They're identically scored, so no difference there. However, percentage-wise, we have 241%. So this is 141% faster than the Pentium 4s, the Pentium Ds, the entire lineup there. And that's for both the 512K and one megabyte versions. So we're talking almost two and a half times faster in integer performance. This is massive. And this is the reason why for gaming especially, which is integer heavy, the Athlon 64 CPUs just dominated. Now moving on to the IDA 64 cache latency, tests, I actually included memory latency as well as the internal memory controller on the new Athlon 64s may come into play. So I wanted to check that out as well. And there's a pretty interesting bit, which you might be seeing here with the L2 cache on the one megabyte Athlon 64. If we look at the 512K, we have 7.8 nanoseconds on the Pentium Ds, 10.6, 10.4. And then we have 22.1 latency on the one megabyte version of the Athlon 64. And this is the fastest CPU in all of our benchmarks with the highest L2 latency. Now I wanted to show you guys directly what I was looking at. I benchmarked this several times to make sure that this wasn't an error. And it is indeed coming up at 22.1 nanoseconds. So ironically enough, these CPUs did not need this fast of L2 cache apparently as it made little to no difference in real world performance. Now, as far as memory latency goes, due to the internal memory controller, we do see that the Athlon 64 one megabyte does have a little bit faster memory controller there at 59.1 nanoseconds as compared to the 62.1 on the 512K. Not a huge difference, but there is a little bit of a difference there. And perhaps that helps make up some of this. I, I don't know, honestly, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not entirely sure what's the deal there but this is definitely the fastest and we can tell that the intel cpus with the motherboard taking care of the memory controller these are much further behind at 87.9 and 86.2 respectively so that's about a 25 30 percent increase on the memory latency all right guys so to put this into perspective the overall numbers are here so the Athlon 64 one megabyte version is coming in at 169%. So this is 69% faster than the Pentium D830 Prescott core with one megabyte of L2 cache. Moving up to the Cedar Mill, we jump up 2%, which isn't that big of a deal. Uh, it's essentially identical. And then we have the Athlon 64 512 kilobytes of L2 cache. So we're talking about one quarter of the L2 cache here and half the L2 cache on the 830 coming in at 60% faster than the 830 and essentially 60% faster than the Pentium 4 uh, Cedar Mill cores as well. So this right here is a massive difference. This is a generational leap over 
this architecture. Really, the only limiting factor that AMD had at the time was achieving the identical clock speeds of the Pentium series. Now, just to give you guys a heads up, the Athlon 64 6000 Plus, this is a 90 nanometer chip. So it's not like that this was some sort of future technology here. It just took AMD a while to refine it or just took them a while to want to produce a chip that fast as they could clearly compete with Intel at much, much lower clock speeds. Well, already guys, there you have it. We have the Athlon 64 anywhere between 60 to 69% faster clock for clock than its Pentium 4 counterparts. So that's a lot higher than I thought it was going to be. You know, back in the day, we didn't really look at things this deep, or I certainly didn't. Most review outlets didn't. Nobody really analyzed things quite as much as we do now because we don't really have the same level of gains. Now, the big question is going to be, is how does this Athlon 64 CPU and architecture really compare to the Intel Core architecture? So we know that that was huge. Conroe was a massive win for Intel back in the day. But considering how far ahead AMD is over the NetBurst architecture, really how much better was it in real life? Well, that's what we're going to go over in the next IPC test. So you guys stick around for that. If you haven't subscribed, please do that. Hit that little bell next to it. You'll be notified whenever videos come up. So this way you don't miss that one right there. Once again, I want to give all my patrons a shout out. Thank you for your support. You're helping me get these parts on hands. And if you guys aren't patrons already and you're interested in these types of videos and want to see this continue, please go ahead and consider helping me out. Just go ahead and click the link in the description or one of the little buttons I have floating around here. And that really helps me out. That helps me get this stuff on hand so I can test it and do videos like this for you guys. Now, this is more of an academic test. I have some fun ones planned in the future using these parts, but I think that this is really cool. I really like seeing you know, where things really stood, real world performance next to the chips that we had back in the day, because, well, honestly, I didn't have access to everything back then and most people didn't. So these tests weren't done. So it, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Does this really help you out? Do you really like knowing this information? Um, did you guys think that the Athlon 64 was 60 to 70% essentially better than the Pentium 4? We all knew that they were better, but that's a huge difference. Once again, let me know what you guys think down below. And if you like this video, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. Please share with friends. This is good stuff. Let the world know that this is where things were back in the mid-2000s. That's all I have for today. And I will catch you guys in the next video.